everybody welcome back to our chapter book read-along of Percy Jackson and the Olympians the lightning thief by Rick Riordan we are reading this totally awesome illustrated copy illustrated by John Rocco and we have really just got into the story but a lot has been happening so just a couple of reminders the gods and other monsters and things that happen in this story are based on Greek mythology. Now Greek mythology is classic tales that were made up a long time ago by those who lived in Greece. Some of them even worshipped these gods and thought they controlled like the weather and many other things. So our author Rick Riordan took those and put it in this really cool modern tale with our hero, Percy Jackson. Now, if you're watching this with someone, take a moment, pause the video, talk about what you remember, maybe some of your favorite parts so far, some characters you remember, what has happened in our first three chapters of this book. Then, here goes my review. Percy Jackson is our main character. He is currently attending Yancey Academy at the beginning of this book and goes on a field trip with his teacher, Mr. Brunner, his friend, Grover, and his not-so-friend, Nancy Boba Fett, and their other teacher, Mrs. Dodds, at the Museum of Art. Well, Nancy and Percy kind of get into a fight, and somehow Nancy ends up in the fountain. Mrs. Dodds is not happy and takes him back into the museum, but Mrs. Dodds is acting very strange and suddenly turns into a monster. She grows talons. She has glowing eyes. She has giant wings. Well, Percy's other teacher, Mr. Brunner, tosses him a pen that turns into a sword and Percy slashes through the monster and she disintegrates. Well, in the second chapter, Percy keeps being told that Mrs. Dodds never existed, that he's making this all up. And it kind of frustrates him, and he has some hard times at school. So he ends up getting kicked out of Yancey Academy. But he rides with his friend Grover back to Manhattan, where we meet his mom in New York City. Her name is Sally, and she is the nicest person ever. She is married to a not nice person named Gabe Ugliano. Percy calls him Smelly Gabe. And they uh, have some rough times at home. Well, Percy's mom wants to celebrate Percy being back for the summer, so they go to their favorite place, a cabin on the beach. Well, it starts storming really bad, and someone knocks on the door. It's Grover, back again. He looks a little different. We'll see exactly what that is in the next chapter but we find that they have to hit the road. Something big is coming. So let's see what happens in our next chapter, chapter four of The Lightning Thief. Enjoy. Chapter four, my mother teaches me bullfighting. We tore through the night along dark country roads. Wind slammed against the Camaro. Rain lashed the windshield. I didn't know how my mom could see anything but she kept her foot on the gas. Every time there was a flash of lightning, I looked at Grover sitting next to me in the back seat and wondered if I'd gone insane or if he was wearing some kind of shag carpet pants. But no, the smell was one I remembered from kindergarten field trips to the petting zoo. Lanolin, like from wool. The smell of a wet barnyard animal. All I could think to say was, so you and my mom know each other? Grover's eyes flitted to the rearview mirror, though there were no cars behind us. Not exactly, he said. I, I mean, we've never met in person, but she knew I was watching you. Watching me? Keeping tabs on you, make, making sure you were okay. But I wasn't faking being your friend, he added hastily. I am your friend. Um, what are you exactly? That doesn't matter right now. It doesn't matter. From the waist down, my best friend is a donkey. Grover let out a sharp throaty, blah! I'd heard him made that sound before, but I'd always assumed it was a nervous laugh. Now I realized it was more of an irritated bleat. 
Goat, he cried. What? I'm a goat from the waist down. You just said it didn't matter. Bah! There's some satyrs that would trample you under hoof for such an insult. Whoa, wait. Satyrs? You mean like Mr. Brunner's myths? Were those old ladies at the fruit stand a myth, Percy? Was Mrs. Dodds a myth? So you admit there was a Mrs. Dodds? Of course. Then why? The less you knew, the fewer monsters you'd attract, Grover said. Like that should be perfectly obvious. We put mist over the human's eyes. We, we'd hoped you'd think the kindly one was a hallucination. But it was no good. You started to realize who you were. Who I... Wait a minute. What do you mean? The wind bellowing noise rose up somehow behind us, closer than before. Whatever was chasing us was still on our tail. Percy, my mom said, there's too much to explain and not enough time. We have to get you to safety. Safety from what? Who's after me? Oh, nobody much, Grover said, obviously still miffed about the donkey comment. Just the Lord of the Dead and a few of his bloodthirstiest minions. Grover! Sorry, Mrs. Jackson. Could you drive a little faster, please? I tried to wrap my mind around what was happening, but I couldn't do it. I knew this wasn't a dream. I had no imagination. I could never dream up something this weird. My mom made a hard left. We swerved into a narrower road, racing past darkened farmhouses and wooded hills and pick-your-own-strawberries signs on white picket fences. Where are we going? I asked. The summer camp I told you about. My mother's voice was tight. She was trying for my sake not to be scared. The place your father wanted to send you. The place you didn't want me to go. Please, dear, my mother begged. This is hard enough. Try to understand. You're in danger. Because some old ladies cut yarn? Those weren't old ladies, Grover said. Those were the fates. Do you know what that means? The fact that they appeared in front of you? They only do that when you're about to... When someone's about to die. Whoa, you just said you. No, I didn't. I said someone. You meant you, as in me. I meant you like someone, not you, you. Boys, my mom said. She pulled the wheel hard to the right, and I got a glimpse of a figure she'd swerved to avoid. A dark, fluttering shape now lost behind us in the storm. What was that? I asked. We're almost there, my mother said, ignoring my question. Another mile. Please, please, please. I didn't know where there was, but I found myself leaning forward in the car, anticipating, wanting us to arrive. Outside, nothing but rain and darkness. The kind of empty countryside you get way out on the tip of Long Island. I thought about Mrs. Dodds and the moment when she'd changed into the thing with pointed teeth and leathery wings. My limbs went numb from delayed shock. She really hadn't been human. She'd meant to kill me. Then I thought about Mr. Brunner and the sword he had thrown me. Before I could ask Grover about that, the hair rose on the back of my neck. There was a blinding flash, a jaw-rattling boom, and our car exploded. I remember feeling weightless, like I was being crushed, fried, and hosed down all at the same time. I peeled my forehead off the back of the driver's seat and said, Ow! Percy! My mom shouted, I'm okay. I tried to shake off the daze. I wasn't dead. The car hadn't really exploded. We'd swerved into a ditch. Our driver's side doors were wedged in the mud. The roof had cracked open like an eggshell, and rain was pouring in. Lightning. That was the only explanation. We'd been blasted right off the road. Next to me, in the back seat, was a big, motionless lump. Grover! He slumped over, blood trickling from the side of his mouth. I shook his furry hip, thinking, No! Even if you are half barnyard animal, you're my best friend and I don't want you to die. Then he groaned, Food! And I knew there was hope. Percy! My mother said, We have to! Her voice faltered. I looked back. In a flash of lightning, 
Through the mud-spattered rear window, I saw a figure lumbering toward us on the shoulder of the road. The sight of it made my skin crawl. It was a dark silhouette of a huge guy, like a football player. He seemed to be holding a blanket over his head. His top half was bulky and fuzzy. His upraised hands made it look like he had horns. I swallowed hard. Who is... Percy, she said, deadly serious. Get out of the car. My mother threw herself against the driver's side door. It was jammed shut in the mud. I tried mine, stuck too. I looked up desperately at the hole in the roof. It might have been an exit, but the edges were sizzling and smoking. Climb out the passenger side, my mother told me. Percy, you have to run. Do you see that big tree? What? Another flash of lightning, and through the smoking hole in the roof, I saw the tree she meant. A huge, white house Christmas tree-sized pine at the crest of the nearest hill. That's the property line, my mom said. Get over the hill, and you'll see a big farmhouse down in the valley. Run, and don't look back. Yell for help. Don't stop until you reach the door. Mom, you're coming too. Her face was pale, her eyes as sad as when she looked at the ocean. No, I shouted. You are coming with me. Help me carry Grover. Food, Grover moaned a little louder. The man with the blanket on his head kept coming toward us, making his grunting, snorting noises. As he got closer, I realized he couldn't be holding a blanket over his head because his hands, huge, meaty hands, were swinging at his sides. There was no blanket, meaning the bulky, fuzzy mass that was too big to be his head was his head. And the points that looked like horns? He doesn't want us, my mother told me. He wants you. Besides, I can't cross the property line. But we don't have time, Percy. Go, please. I got mad then. Mad at my mother, at Grover the goat, at the thing with the horns that was lumbering toward us slowly and deliberately like, like a bull. I climbed across Grover and pushed the door open into the rain. We're going together. Come on, Mom. I told you, Mom, I'm not leaving you. Help me with Grover. I didn't wait for her to answer. I scrambled outside, dragging Grover from the car. He was surprisingly light, but I couldn't have carried him very far if my mom hadn't come to my aid. Together, we draped Grover's arms over our shoulders and started stumbling uphill through the wet, waist-high grass. Glancing back, I got my first clear look at the monster. He was seven feet tall, easy. His arms and legs like something from the cover of Muscle Man magazine. Bulging biceps and triceps and a bunch of other steps, all stuffed like baseballs under vein-webbed skin. He wore no clothes except underwear. I mean, bright white Fruit of the Looms, which would have looked funny except that the top half of his body was so scary. Coarse brown hair started at about his belly button and got thicker as it reached his shoulders. His neck was a mass of muscle and fur leading up to his enormous head which had a snout as long as my arm, snooty nostrils with gleaming brass ring, cruel black eyes and horns, enormous black and white horns with points you just couldn't get from an electric sharpener. I recognized the monster all right. He had been one of the first stories Mr. Brunner had told us, but he couldn't be real. I blinked the rain out of my eyes. That's... Pacifist son, my mother said. I wish I'd known how badly they wanted to kill you. But he's the min... Don't say his name, she warned. Names have power. The pine tree was still way too far, a hundred yards uphill at least. I glanced behind me again. The bull man hunched over our car, looking in the windows, or not looking exactly, more like snuffling, nuzzling. I wasn't sure why he bothered, since we were only about 50 feet away. Food, Grover moaned. Shh, I told him. Mom, what's he doing? Doesn't he see us? He goes by smell, but he'll figure out where we are soon enough. As if on cue, the bull man bellowed in rage. 
He picked up Gabe's Camaro by the torn roof, the chassis creaking and groaning. He raised the car over his head and threw it down the road. It slammed into the wet asphalt and skidded in a shower of sparks for about half a mile before coming to a stop. The gas tank exploded. Not a scratch, I remembered Gabe saying. Oops. Percy, my mom said. When he sees us, he'll charge. Wait until the last second, then jump out of the way, directly sideways. He can't change directions very well once he's charging. Do you understand? How do you know all this? I've been worried about an attack for a long time. I should have expected this. I was selfish keeping you near me. Keeping me near you, but... Another bellow of rage. The bull man started tromping uphill. He'd smelled us. The pine tree was only a few more yards, but the hill was getting steeper and slicker, and Grover wasn't getting any lighter. The bull man closed in. Another few seconds, and he'd be on top of us. My mother must have been exhausted, but she shouldered Grover. Go, Percy! Separate! Remember what I said! I didn't want to split up, but I had the feeling she was right. It was our only chance. I sprinted to the left, turned, and saw the creature bearing down on me. His black eyes glowed with hate. He reeked like rotten meat. He lowered his head and charged. Those razor-sharp horns aimed straight at my chest. The fear in my stomach made me want to bolt, but that wouldn't work. I could never outrun this thing. So I held my ground, and at the last moment, I jumped to the side. The bull man stormed past me like a freight train, then bellowed with frustration and turned. But not toward me this time, toward my mother, who was setting Grover down in the grass. We'd reached the crest of the hill. Down the other side, I could see a valley. Just as my mother had said, the lights of a farmhouse glowing yellow through the rain. But that was half a mile away. We'd never make it. The bull man grunted, pawing the ground. He kept eyeing my mother, who was now retreating slowly downhill, back toward the road, trying to lead the monster away from Grover. Run, Percy, she told me. I can't go any further. Run! But I just stood there, frozen in fear, as the monster charged her. She tried to sidestep, as she told me to do, But the monster had learned his lesson. His hand shot out and grabbed her by the neck as she tried to get away. He lifted her as she struggled, kicking and pummeling him the air. Mom! She caught my eyes, managed to choke out one last word. Go! Then, with an angry roar, the monster closed his fists around my mother's neck, and she dissolved before my eyes, melting into light, a shimmering golden form as if she were a holographic projection, a blinding flash, and she was simply gone. No! Anger replaced my fear. Newfound strength burned in my limbs, the same rush of energy I'd gotten when Mrs. Dodds grew talons. The bull man bore down on Grover, who lay helpless in the grass. The monster hunched over, snuffling my best friend as if he were about to lift Grover up and make him dissolve too. I couldn't allow that. I stripped off my red rain jacket. Hey! I screamed, waving the jacket, running to one side of the monster. Hey, stupid! Ground beef! Roar! The monster turned toward me, shaking his meaty fists. I had an idea. A stupid idea, but better than no idea at all. I put my back to the big pine tree and waved my red jacket in front of the bull man, thinking I'd jump out of the way at the last moment. But it didn't happen like that. The bull man charged too fast, his arms out to grab me whichever way I tried to dodge. Time slowed down. My legs tensed. I couldn't jump sideways, so I leapt straight up, kicking off from the creature's head, using it as a springboard, turning in midair, and landing on his neck. How did I do that? I didn't have time to figure it out. A millisecond later, the monster's head slammed into the tree, and the impact nearly knocked my teeth out. The bull man staggered around, trying to shake me. I locked my arms around his horns, 
to keep from being thrown. Thunder and lightning were still going strong. The rain was in my eyes. The smell of rotten meat burned my nostrils. The monster shook himself around and bucked like a rodeo bull. He shouldn't have just backed into the tree and smashed me flat, but I was starting to realize that this thing had only one gear, forward. Meanwhile, Grover started groaning in the grass. I wanted to yell at him to shush, but the way I was getting tossed around, if I opened my mouth, I'd bite my tongue off. Food, Grover moaned. The bull man wheeled toward him, pawing at the ground again, and got ready to charge. I thought about how he had squeezed the life out of my mother, made her disappear in a flash of light, and rage filled me like high-octane fuel. I got both hands around one horn, and I pulled backwards with all my might. The monster tensed, gave a surprised grunt, then snap! The bull man screamed and flung me through the air. I landed flat on my back in the grass. My head smacked against a rock. When I sat up, my vision was blurry, but I had a horn in my hands, a ragged bone weapon the size of a knife. The monster charged. Without thinking, I rolled to one side and came up kneeling. As the monster barreled past, I drove the broken horn straight into his side, right up under his furry rib cage. The bull man roared in agony. He flailed, clawing at his chest, then began to disintegrate. Not like my mother in a flash of golden light, but like crumbling sand, blown away in chunks by the wind, the same way Mrs. Dodds had burst apart. The monster was gone. The rain stopped. The storm still rumbled, but only in the distance. I smelled like livestock, and my knees were shaking. My head felt like it was splitting open. I was weak and scared and trembling with grief. I'd just seen my mother vanish. I wanted to lie down and cry, but there was Grover needing my help, so I managed to haul him up and stagger down into the valley, toward the lights of the farmhouse. I was crying, calling for my mother, but I held on to Grover. I wasn't going to let him go, too. The last thing I remember is collapsing on a wooden porch, looking up at the ceiling fans circling above me, moths flying around a yellow light, and the stern faces of a familiar-looking bearded man and a pretty girl, her blonde hair curled like a princess. They both looked down at me, and the girl said, He's the one! He must be! Silence, Annabeth, the man said. He's still conscious. Bring him inside. Oh boy, a lot happened in that chapter. I hope Percy's mom is okay, and that Percy's okay, and that Grover's okay. Whew, a lot happened. Let's discuss exactly what occurred so we can remember. So, the name of this title is My Mom Teaches Me Bullfighting. Eh, Kinda. (laughs) What does Percy say at the beginning of this chapter that insults Grover? What animal does he call him? He calls him half donkey. Oh boy. Grover is half goat. (laughs) He is a mythological, which means it's a made up creature. Those do not really exist in real life. Creature called a satyr. And so these were guides and they protected heroes and they also really care about the environment and the wild. According to Grover, who is after Percy? Percy keeps saying, what are we running from? Someone tell me. And so Grover says, what does he say? Do we remember? The Lord of the Dead and all of his meanest minions, of which Percy's mom says, Grover! (laughs) So that's not good. Yeesh. What happens to make them crash the car? What happens? A lightning bolt literally strikes the car. Percy thought it exploded, didn't he? But it was a lightning bolt. It hit the car. And so she crashed 
um, Percy's mom crashed into the ditch. What does Percy's mom tell him to do as they're trying to get out of the car? What does she tell him to do? To run away. He's after whatever this thing that's following them is after Percy. But I have to agree with Percy. I wouldn't have left them behind. Grover was just kind of moaning words, so it means he was pretty hurt. And his mom couldn't carry Grover all by herself. So he said, nope, not going without you. What is strange about the bull man's appearance? What does Percy think is the weirdest thing other than it being a literal guy with a bull head? I think that's probably the weirdest thing. <laughs> this, if you have heard of these before, it is called a minotaur, which is a mythological creature, so it does not really exist, from Greek mythology specifically. Now, this minotaur is a little even weirder than the other ones, right? It has <laughs> white underwear on. <laughs> Percy's like, what is that? So here's a picture from another book I have of the minotaur. And his kind of mean looking face. He has big horns, doesn't he? But in the book, it, it describes him as just wearing kind of like whitey tidies, <laughs> which is very strange to see on a giant monster. What happened, though, to Percy's mom? This is big. What happens? The Minotaur catches her, right? But he doesn't squeezes and then she does what she disappeared in a golden light so i have hope that she's gonna be okay but i mean if you were percy i would be devastated that would be so scary all right what does grover keep doing that catches the monster's attention what does he keep doing He's not quiet, is he? <laughs> he keeps going, food, food. <laughs> Which is not good because the Minotaur can't see very well, so he follows smell and hearing. Yeesh. So, what is one of the last things that Percy remembers before passing out at the end of this chapter? A familiar face? And a girl with blonde hair. We'll see what the girl with blonde hair is. But I think you guys all probably will recognize the familiar face. Alright, that is where we are going to end today. We will continue our reading of The Lightning Thief in our next video. I hope you have enjoyed, and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone!